Welcome to the Ugly Dip Podcast, episode 8. Starting off as, starting off as always, a big massive shout out to our sponsors. Again, massively grateful um, sponsoring us straight off from the bat. We are sponsored by Coral Sea Raiding Company and Spindrift Tactical, both owned and operated by former and serving snipers. Uh, Coral Sea is coming straight out of Australia. Um, you'll know as Carl was on last week. And again, Spindrift Tactical owned and operated by Royal Marines Snipers. Uh, so a big massive shout out to them. Uh, big massive shout out to our patrons as well. We launched our Patreon last episode, so massive to see everybody jumping on there. Uh, and again, all available episodes will be available early on Recast as well. Today we are joined by the one and only Jason Lilly. How are we, mate? What's up, guys? Honoured to be here. It's a pleasure. Massive thank you for coming on, mate. Um, but I was saying this to... I've seen this to Dom before we started. I was like, we would never say it like six, seven years ago we'd be sitting chatting to one of the guys with Generation yeah. Kill. It's just like, yeah. mind blown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's still mind blowing for me, man. And I was a part of it. You know, it's uh, it's a very humbling experience, very surreal experience, right? Because you grow up watching HBO as a kid, and then holy fuck, they made a a mini series about my guys. You know, I was yeah. just a, dumb, a dumbass marine and. We are on TV. It's kind of weird, man. What's it's, just, uh, it's nice that they've done a pretty good job, didn't they, as well? I, you know, I hear that from a lot of people that I've actually never watched the entire thing. <laughs> okay, all right. No, you know, no, nah, I've watched uh, like an episode or two, and I watched one of the fight scenes and uh, listened to some of the dialogue. So it was, you know, I think they did a pretty good job. But at the end of the day, they're actors portraying mm. psychopaths, psychopaths like us. So. Uh, <laughs> As you know, it's they do good, they do good, but it's still that dialogue's not a hundred percent there. So we're a lot more vile and toxic and uh, angry. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit too realistic for the public, that though, not it? They like to think we're yeah. Like, if it was that, intelligence. yeah, if it was realistic, I don't think it would have went down as well. Like if it was, if it was the level at which we are. Um, yeah. Yeah. And what's pretty impressive is the fact that yeah. is that's like Generation Kill is only like a very small part of your career, mate, isn't it? Like, in it case is. and and then people will obviously will only see that as well. So you, you were part of the recon units there. Yep. From there, you went to Marsoc, didn't you? Yep. Yep. Did Marsoc and then uh, got out of Marsoc in '11. Worked for the U.S. State Department as a DDM, as a sniper for a year and a half, and then uh, worked for the CIA for almost five years, and then. In 2016, decided to try to be a normal human again and assimilate back into a society that's unlike the military. And uh, here I am, still trying to fit in every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's always that's always something that makes me laugh is the um, is the fact that you guys just go and work for the CIA. Like we see that, <laughs> and it's because yeah. that's it's obviously we have nothing. I don't obviously we do, but you don't hear about it. So it's normally like the Hereford guys, or it'll be one of the SB guys, or they'll go and work for someone private contracting. But it's right. just generally it's not something. I suppose it's movies that make it portray it for us from your sense that it's very much that. So what's that film? Is it Thirteen Hours? The guys yeah. in Benghazi. Well, that was my team. That, that was who I worked for. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they're the Benghazi guys were GRS guys, which is global response staff. And that's, that was the unit that I was with, but just a different team in a different location. So, so same, same guys. So, oh, yeah. And I still have never seen that. Um, but <laughs> I know a lot, a lot of those guys that were there. And in fact, when I graduated from that course, one of the guys that was there came and spoke to us about the job and he came in on crutches and, had a scar from his armpit down to his fucked up hand. He was one of the guys on top that got hit by mortars. And, uh, you know, there was only like six of us in the course that actually graduated because the attrition rate's pretty high. But he came and spoke, and and that just happened. Benghazi happened a month or two before that and really drove that fucking point home. Like, yo, you guys are alone and unafraid. You guys are – it's not like the military, man. You know, you guys are like – small ass fucking teens with no mm. support like big military support with you know close air support and fucking qrf like it's it's the real fucking deal you know so it really drove a fucking point home uh for me and for all of us that were there that day i can imagine and that's the thing you notice obviously you've not seen it but that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize when they go private is um 
like a lot of our guys we know that do CP and stuff, there's no Mert on station, there's no Pedro, there's no, if, if you're in the shit, there's no one coming to help you, that's you stuck there. That's uh, it, man. You better fucking know your boys and you better continue to train when you can. And obviously we did, but I drank a lot more <laughs> than I did in the military, believe it or not. And we partied a lot more. It was, it was better and worse, right? The money was fucking unreal, but uh, the job was quite different and a lot more political and a lot more if you fuck up like it's going to be national news so it's uh yeah man so yeah i did recon until uh well i was an infantryman i was a 0311 uh for the marine corps like an 11 bravo in the army so basically just a basic infantryman and i'm really glad i did that you know i did two years of that and those boys that i served with you know i was only 20 21 a lot of those dudes were like 18, 19, you know, I call those like my freshman years of school in a way, you know, like that was like Marine Corps, the, you know, the meat potatoes. That's like the heartbeat of the Marine Corps is, is, is an infantryman. Like to me, 03, 0311 infantryman is the Marine Corps and everything else is kind of secondary to some degree. So I did that and then I was in Japan and then I tried out for recon. I uh, went to recon school called the basic reconnaissance course and then got to first recon Bravo company, second platoon. And then not long after that, we went to fucking Iraq, dude. And then the whole generation kill thing happened. So, um, crazy fucking deployment. That was my first, you know, first time I'd ever been in combat. So it was the first, really the first time the war really kicked off outside of Afghanistan in 01 and very few Americans actually were a part of that. Mm. Um, but as you know, fuck, dude, that was, that was crazy. You know, it was, it was an incredible time and it's still pretty mind blowing to think about it. Um, so I did that. And then I was only home for six months, maybe eight months. And then like, Hey, you're going to Fallujah, you're going to Iraq again. Um, good luck. So I went back to Iraq again for another six months. And then, you know, which was a really between Operation Iraqi Freedom 1 and 2, those first two deployments, uh, was night and day difference. The second deployment was fucking whooping it on, man. Like the second deployment, the, the enemy TTPs, the enemy had really advanced and responded to, it's a chess game, man. They responded to our, our pawns moving and they, uh, they learned really fucking fast. They got a lot of support from Iran, like their IEDs. We had no IEDs in OF1. And then six months later, there's fucking IEDs, command Everything FAD. You. Yeah, Orion, like, what the fuck? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that uh, oh shit. Uh, Iraqi Freedom 1 was basically you were kind of fighting against, a, like a, obviously not, cr not, not defeated, but like a crumbling Iraqi army. Yep, so a crumbling. Of, there, was, there was crumbling ahead of you. And then the second one, yep. basically, they, they kind of figured out we can't stand and fight with these guys. And they just readjusted their tactics. Is that kind of what happened? That's a really simple way to put it. Yeah, man, for our listeners. Yeah, because we fought. I mean, you said it, bro. Like a crumbling uniformed army military um you know the the fedayeen where they're like the inner circle uh of saddam's like kind of elite that kind of protected baghdad and the higher echelon of the political sphere and then the republican army was like the next tier and all those guys were you know some were defecting obviously um some were still fighting depending on where you were at and their, their, how sympathetic they were to the cause and so yeah, man, we fought guys that were uniformed and I, the first dudes we shot were from Syria and they were wearing fucking white Nikes and blue jeans and they, they came over jihad from Syria and then it was Jordanians. So already the first deployment was jihad from these, you know, Islamic countries, which I totally understand, you know, so fuck yeah, the Americans are in your backyard. Let's go fucking kill some Yanks. Mm. So I get it, you know, so... And then OF2 was, was more the insurgency, was more the underground networks of them trying to repel us. And yeah, that second deployment was fucking nuts, man, for sure. What year was that? In? 04. 04, 04, 04 yeah. 04. Yeah, right. That'd be like the yeah. first bits of fucking shape charges getting introduced and shit. That's just when shit got yeah. dirty. Yeah. yeah, not at the beginning of 04, but at the back end is when we started seeing... You know, it was still command detonated wires. I don't think it was wireless yet. It might have been, might have moved the cell phones, but it rapidly month to month to month, and depending on what 
foreign entity was teaching them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because at that point we started taking uh, it, uh, enemy from Chechnya. We were taking Chechen uh, snipers. You know, as a young guy, like holy, because you hear about Chechnya. You know, it's like holy yeah. fuck, I'm fighting fucking basically like white boys that are heavily trained as snipers against us. It, it kind of makes you. They're used to used to shooting. You're basically no offense, but like fucking goat farmers, basically to fucking Chechen snipers. Like, oh <laughs> fuck, dude. You know, shit's shit's a little bit more real. Yeah. So uh, luckily, they didn't come over in mass numbers. Thank God. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it changed as you guys know. Warfare changes monthly, daily. So, so what? Sorry, when did you become a sniper? Was that previous to rocket? No, believe it or not, man. Uh, so I did in the Marine Corps, it, it's for the most part, four year tours, four year enlistments. So 2004, and then I got out, I got out for a year and a half, two years, was thinking about the Navy SEALs. And then MARSOC, I got wind of MARSOC from all my boys that were still in the Marines as recon Marines, you know, either force or battalion recon, they're like, yo, we're getting our first official SOCOM approved special operations unit called MARSOC. Like, fuck the Navy, dude. Like, <laughs> like come back in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Fuck, that, fuck that uniform. Like, come back yeah. in, man. So I did, um, and I got to MARSOC six months after it started. And then within three months, I was in sniper school. So, nice. um, and I had not shot a fucking gun, dude. I've not touched a gun since Iraq. Like, I got back, and I was, like, surfing and, like, smoking weed and fucking... <laughs> You know, hanging out with the ladies and shit in California and then wearing sandals every day. Like, just, they got a lip piercing, you know? Like, I was fucking, I was done. <laughs> it's good to, it's good then, to the leave the military the same everywhere. everywhere yeah, man, same you know, everywhere. go fucking, go crazy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Beer and fucking strippers, like, it was fucking great. And then uh, I started to miss it, as you guys know. And uh, I started to miss the camaraderie and the boys, you know? And, uh... And realized I was actually quite different than the peers that were civilians, you know, and they didn't understand and nor it's not their fault, but they didn't understand what I've gone through. And it was hard to, there was like a wall there, man, especially when I was younger. So I ended up going back in and then, uh, they're like, Hey, for you to go to sniper school, you need to shoot expert again with the M16 and four. And I was a fifth award expert. I'd shot expert every fucking time, but I, dude, I haven't touched an M4 or an M16 in fucking years so they're like if you don't pass if you don't get expert you're not going to sniper school and you're getting kicked out of marsoc i'm like well fuck <laughs> so you know i had to go to the fucking shooting line and they're like take apart your weapon to show it's clear i had to like break down this well i haven't touched a gun so i'm kind of like finger fucking it like i forgot but didn't forget i'm like and marsoc was such a new thing all these other like phones were left and right they're like who the fuck are these guys and i'm like yeah, he's fucking this up you know looking like a new guy basically <laughs> so ended up passing went to sniper school in 07 to answer your question and the marine corps scout basic scout sniper school out of uh out of camp pendleton so um and to me that was the one school as a marine that was like the pinnacle man and like a career like especially on the marine corps side like that's the fucking course fuck the army no offense like marine corps snipers like that's everyone knows the legend right so just being able to go to that school was super fucking humbling man it was you know i, I know the lineage from world war ii to fucking vietnam dude i was like in the halls of like viking fucking warriors man like it was it was awesome and i almost got kicked out day one because my hair was too long and fucking i had an attitude so <laughs> I think we were, um, I think we were the opposite in that sense. I think we were a bit more lenient when it came to, I'm sure it was. Like snipers in general in the British Army are a bit more lenient and stuff. Whereas normally it might be, I don't know what it's like for the Marine Corps, they might be a bit more strict and you need to be a bit more by the book. Whereas with us, it was like the opposite almost. Yeah. Like you could have your sideburns could be a little bit lower and you could have a little bit longer hair. Once so qualified. So you're fucking right, man. We are the same, especially in recon and MARSOC, yes. Mm. However, this was the basic scout sniper schools attached to like the normal infantry schools, ah, right. but the school section. So their regulations are fucking tighter. Yeah. So, and then plus the hatred for MARSOC had already started because um, the Marines are, they, we, 
they're like it's a wolf pack dude we eat it like it's alpha shit and they're like fuck those guys they're a bunch of fucking cow everyone just talks shit dude so they're like who's marsad like fuck these guys so me showing up with really long hair and pretty new back into the marine corps like i was a target day one so mm. uh it was a good humbling experience to like by force to kind of you need to get back into the game and like just be the great man and, and not stand out so uh it was a really good school man and i talked to a lot of those guys still to this day that i was in that course with you know as of like today actually i talked to a couple of them so uh it was an honor to to pass that school uh the stocking phase was amazing um yeah it was, it was a good fucking school and that was just the basic course then i went to a bunch of different sniper schools after that how, so, how long is that that initial basic course like 10 weeks some, some 10 weeks, weeks man 10 to 12 weeks it's been a long time but i think it's 10 weeks yeah it's similar to ours then yeah mm. yeah and it's it's not a gentleman's course it's definitely everyday survival academically speaking and physically and and shooting you know it's yeah. guys get dropped the attrition rate still it's not crazy in that course but there still is an attrition rate for sure yeah i'm yeah. not even sure i'm sure we spoke about this before i don't even know what the i think it's like 80 percent or it was at some point 80 85 percent attrition rate or something which is pretty yeah and, and all you guys know i mean sniping to every kind of special forces tryout they're all kind of in the same realm you know it's sleep deprivation food deprivation physical shit out the ass you know and then the academic side so yeah it kind of weeds out the week as it should you know yeah so yeah, yeah it, sh it should be there the dumb but we're all still here <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, man. yeah. Wow. um <laughs> what's gonna say <laughs> sorry um so we're going back to like so you were a pre guat joiner weren't you what was your motivation because most most of the guys we spoke to are it was 9 11 and that was that was their main because i know it wasn't so much for me but that was in the background because of mm. iraq because of afghanistan what was your motivation for joining you know uh just to like you guys get away from home uh to go i grew up on national geographic and the bbc and npr i grew up like listening to all this shit throughout the world and like that adventurous spirit was there so i wanted to see you know, it's like a bird in a nest. I wanted to see what was further out in the forest, right? I just wanted to get the fuck out. And uh, as we talked about earlier before we recorded, you know, uh, I, I just wanted to leave home and go cut my teeth and become my own man. And what a good way to do it with the military, right? So yeah. uh, that was the reason. And it wasn't really, I actually never saw myself as a Marine, um, really the military, but I was getting into a lot of trouble man i was stealing guns i was fighting a lot um mm. i was partying a lot like every time we party we get in a fight like it was pretty violent at that time in kansas and i ran with a pretty violent crew of guys and except i was like a really nice guy inside but i don't know i was just kind of acting out you know and uh parents divorced so i was kind of a little fucked up in the head and then uh i knew if i didn't get a boot up my fucking ass I was going to be going to prison for sure for something stupid you know i was making dumb mistakes i was pretty lost and pretty hopeless and the marine corps is definitely what rekindled that fire in direction and serve like purpose right so and just just confidence in myself again you know so as you know life's hard man and for a young man it's it's, it's hard to to kind of figure out your direction in life and, and that was a catalyst for the change that i i needed so um yeah I mean, it, it was good i think that's quite common like the background i'm the same i was like um parents divorced when i was young um so obviously i had like two older brothers who both lived away so it was just me and my mum um and grew up that way and it's almost like a not like a yearning that's a weird way of saying it makes it sound super sad but it's almost like you you want to be part of something bigger is that if that makes sense yes. kind of like that that almost um and once you get it, and I think once you have been looking for that and you do end up getting it, it means a lot more than it would to someone who just joined for the sake of joining. Um, and I think that's quite quite a common thing. And I think that's, you connect with people um, a lot better in the military who are generally from similar backgrounds, not always the same, but it's, it's very much similar. And I think that's what will make that connection tighter, won't it? You're 100% right, man. It's, uh, 
it, it, but it was a, a calling it, it was a yearning it was a yearning to to be a part of something in, in it wasn't very common where I was from you know there was like random people most people joined the army where I'm from and even that was a small number uh and it was really because of a friend that talked me into the marine corps and even before I heard of the marine well the marines I heard of the marines but I heard about recon through this friend and I saw it on a movie called clear and present danger mm. <laughs> and uh that team got fucked up in the jungle which is kind of a bad representation of recon right but should mm -hmm. should have should have maybe not joined because they all got fucking <laughs> they, got waxed. they got a really bad tick man but uh yeah but still it was there it was like a special unit to me that was like navy seals behind enemy lines a six-man team wearing makeup you know and i played all the fucking games dude and i was just i watched all the fucking movies i was like if I can do this, if I can make it to this level, I will achieve, you know, I'll, 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 you know, the insecurities that I had to getting, like I was pretty picked on as a kid, you know, like I was a really nice kid. I played the fucking French horn, you know, I, I, I was a band geek, you know, I played baseball and shit. I was a sports guy. However, I never defended myself. I was a, such a nice guy and I wanted to be friends with everybody. That was my style, right? Like I, Violence wasn't like a thing until I got a little older and started getting in trouble. So I wanted to, to get tough. I wanted to mm. become a man. I really, I wanted to become a man. That was probably the best way to say it. Like I wanted to become grown. I wanted to make people proud and make my name remembered, you know, and, and for doing something noble and, and not the shithead that, you know, I let a lot of people down at that point, just a young kid. And I wanted to earn my fucking key, dude, and for myself. So, and then just becoming a Marine was kind of day one of like, holy fuck, man. Like, you're 20 years old. I'm a Marine now. Like, I'm on, on track. Like, I'm, I'm getting my, I'm taking the steering wheel, you know, instead of losing control in a car crash. So, mm. um, yeah, man. Uh, and here we are talking now. <laughs> here we are, yeah. I think that's... I'm not gonna say it's the same, but get, I, I find in, in the British Army, anyway, like a lot of guys in snipers are like similar to that kind of background, and that they, I think if most people saw or knew them from children, they wouldn't like most. If they knew most of the guys that are in sniper platoons, I've met anyway. I'm sure if their friends from school met them now that or back in the day, they would never have thought, "Oh, those guys are gonna be snipers." They're usually kind of geeky, yeah. or were at least geeky kind of quiet guys that you wouldn't have put down as being like quite useful in the military, mm. but that's, that's what I think. Anyway, I, th I think I was like that anyway. And I'm no, like, I, you know. brother, you're right. And I, I think it's, it doesn't matter what country you're from. Like there's something special. Like you look at the definition of a warrior, no matter from that culture, there's similar traits, man. And it, it's, it's, I think it's ingrained in your DNA and I think it's passed down from generations, man. There is a calling for, and it's not for everybody, man, but you're right. Some of the guys that I've served with, as you know, are highly cerebral, highly intelligent, but even by speaking, you wouldn't really know that until you really get to fucking know them. And it's like, holy fuck, dude, like this dude is a ninja at taking apart computers or this guy can draw. Holy fuck, this guy is an artist or this guy can play music. This guy was going to be a professional athlete, but like, you think most guys are gigantic beasts, and some are, as you know. Some guys are fucking huge, but most, especially in the sniper special forces realm, are pretty skinny and can go forever, and they'll never fucking quit. Like, that's the mentality is, is never quit. And I never wanted to quit, dude. Like, I was going to fucking die. But my pride and my ego of, like, was so big in the sense of like, I'm not going to be a fucking failure. I failed so much in my life. I'm not fucking failing, dude. Like I'm going to pass out and then get back up and keep fucking going. And that mindset is what separates us from the others, you know, but what you said, brother, like, and some of the nicest guys, man, but also the dudes you don't ever want to meet in a dark alley yeah. at the same time. There's some fucking strange dudes as well. <laughs> That's what I'm going yeah. to say. I would love I wouldn't worry about getting beaten up as well, fucking getting bummed by some of them, but... Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Wake up yeah. and fucking dildo I'm in your ass or something, probably. Yeah. And there's... I, I wish I would have spent more time with you guys. Um, 
I've met a lot of guys from the UK, a lot of Irishmen. I've met a lot of guys overseas, but not day in, day out. You know, I've traded kit in Iraq and Afghanistan with some Brits, and I just wish, I wish there'd have been more cross-pollinization together, mm -hmm. you know, because, like, we all had different sectors, yeah. and we'd see each other and be like, damn, those dudes dress weird, and you guys are like, those fucking Yanks are crazy, man. <laughs> you know, it's like... But, like, we would have gotten along so well if we would have just spent some time together, you know? Yeah. It would I've be not, good, I think. Have you noticed this, Sean? I, 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 it's something I've noticed that the little bit of interaction I've had that, like, the American Army guys, US Army guys, they're always, like, nice, like, polite people. Like, I've met quite a few. But they don't seem to get a lot of our humor. But the Marines I've met have all kind of got similar yeah. to the squad of humor, British Army humor. It seems a lot more similar. British Army and US Marines is more similar than like the, the British Army and the US Army, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, there's a, I don't know why. Yeah, you're, Sorry, equally as, you're saying you're equally as fucked up as we are, I think is as the easiest way to do it. That's it, man. Like, there's something, there's 200,000 active duty Marines and there's a million American Army soldiers. So just that in itself, it's already a smaller unit. And then 10% of the Marine Corps are actually designated fighters. So 20,000 are in the zero three infantry realm and then within that you've got 800 recon marines within that you've got 350 marsoc like raiders operators it we're small bro mm. so we are it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and then you actually break down who actually saw combat like it isn't a lot of fucking dudes man if you think about it and a lot, everyone on instagram and fucking youtube acts like they have most of those dudes fucking have not and it's like time and fucking place right you don't have a choice you know, if you join to be a sniper, you join to be a raider, it's all timing. You can't help the year you were fucking born, right? So there's something for sure where we, there, there's something there, man. We're fucked up. Like we're a different breed. Yeah. We're angry as fuck. And we're all like, it's like a beat down dog, dude. Like we're so, you get treated like shit, man. Like you're a fucking piece of shit from day one. And just when you're getting comfortable, you're a fucking new guy again. You know, like it's, it's just always getting beat down. So like there's this rigidity and there's this like resolve that you have to have as an individual. And then you get with other individuals like that. And it's like, we're a fucking Viking alpha wolf pack, dude. And we're violent. And if we're in groups of two or three or more, we're burning fucking cities down, dude. Yeah. Or, or other things. So, you know, it's, <laughs> you have, it, it takes a, it's a light switch, man. I mean, you got to be, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Let's save this child. Let's cook a meal. Let's be a father. Or it's break out the sword and the fucking shield and fucking mm. behead people. You know, and it's, you, you have to, you have to know where that light switch is at and like when to turn it on and off. So it's mostly off right now. I'm trying to make it off. So, hey, keep yeah. it there ticked, yeah. It's that, I can't remember who it was, like one of those IG accounts had, he always goes on about it. It's something, it's one of the Raider, I can't remember his name, something Raider. Basically it's one of the, the Marine Raider um, Instagram accounts. And he says that, he says professionally savage violence is like the way he describes it, is the way it should always be. Um, which I think's pretty cool terminology and it basically says what you were there, yeah. being able to switch on and off and, and have that, but at all times remain savagely violent, which I think is a, would make a cool t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. It's either, it's either, uh, I mean, I know 98% of the Raiders, especially that are on, on social media, it's either Cody Alfred from we, the, we defy the norm, who was a sniper as well, which I'll connect you guys with. And then Nick Kumalantos, uh, Nick K who was an East Coast Marsoc guy and recon guy as well. So I'm one of those guys, and it's, I've heard that same quote, man. It's, it's, mm. it's true. And it's, it's, then it's not all the time, man. You can't live in that space of hyper violence always. It's, it's taxing to your mind and your soul and your, your energy. So again, it goes back, you got to turn it on and off, you know, and it's mm. when it's time, there's, there's no hesitation, like all in. So just yeah, to, I'm going to take us off on a tangent now. We've seen a, a bunch <laughs> of years ago, I seen Nick, uh, what's the Nick Kamalatos? Cam, it's a Greek name, isn't it? It's hard. It's hard to say. Yeah, yeah Kumalatos. 
I seen it, I don't know if it was on his channel or I've seen it somewhere, a, 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 a speech he was doing where he basically, he spoke about leaving the military and the, the, the struggles he had kind of leaving the military. And he, he said something that as soon as he said it, I was like, that makes sense to like a lot of people I can think of. Is that he was saying about the, like basically, he put it better than this, but basically like when guys leave the military and they start getting like, they think they're getting PTSD, but it's probably more like a separation. They're so used to being around that group of guys who are close to them and very similar to them. And they have the sense of purpose. And then when they leave, they lose that and they kind of lose a huge part, like a huge chunk of their life disappears and they can't really put their finger on what it is. Um, and then they, they go spiral down. He, he explains better than I can, but it's a really good, really good uh, chat he has about. I don't know if you yeah, that. man. It's so jumping into that transitional phase, um, kind of like that wolf pack I was describing, like you're either in a, as it is for you guys, you're in either a two man team, a six man team, a platoon of 23 guys, 20 guys, you know, our numbers are very similar, I'm sure in a lot of ways. Um, and that wolf pack kind of changes with, with members of that pack, right? Sometimes you're the new wolf and there's a senior fucking wolf, right? So like, but you're a part of this group always and members come and go and you might go join a completely new wolf pack. It's still in the same realm. So you're used to being with these individuals that are all very similar and sure each platoon, you've got a fucker you want to punch in the teeth that you would never trust. And, but most of the time you get along with everyone, right? So you're used to this, this pack and it ebbs and flows and then you get out and you can't wait to fucking get out. You can't like fuck the military, like fuck the haircuts, like, Fuck the queen, fuck the president. Like, I'm fucking out. Like, I'm going to go eat some fish and chill the fuck out. And then after, like, a month, three weeks, two months, you know, I'm growing a beard. Yeah, growing my hair out. Fuck yeah, I'm normal again. And then it starts to wear off, man. It's like, you're by yourself, man. And that's the first time in your career, however long it is, four years, five years, 20 years, 30, you're by yourself, truly by yourself and surrounded by civilians for the first time in your entire career. And that's when the signs start to, to rear their head. You know, that's when the signs start to like, damn, I miss, you know, I miss part of the military, but I miss the dudes, you know, and I miss having that sounding board. You know, when you're having a bad day, you can kind of vent to your boys, you know, about very open shit, like very transparent shit. You know, you get close, like family and you kind of lose that. Uh, the daily interaction of that anyway. So that transition's hard, but I think it's even simpler than that. I think it's a male trait. You know, I think it's a, we get wrapped up in our identities, you know, like oh, I'm a Royal Marine, I'm a sniper, um, SAS, SBS, I'm fucking MARSOC, you know, this title, I'm a sergeant. You know, you get wrapped up in these titles and you let those define who you are as an individual, but truly those titles aren't. Like, cause that's not me. It was a job I did. Sure. I loved it. It was a part of my life, but it's not Jason. It's not Dom. You know, it's not Sean. Like who, who am I really? So that transition is who am I? Like what colors do I like? What music do I like? Like what food? Cause like you do four years or 30 years, like what's next? Like, I don't want the military to be the apex of my life. I don't, it's a special, it's a chapter, you know, fucking zero to five years old chapter. Five to fucking 14 chapter, you know, military is a chapter and sometimes it's longer, but it's all a chapter. Like what's next? It's got, there's gotta be something else and you gotta make, this is the most important phase of our lives now. Like who am I in my community? Who am I to my kids, to my friends, to my family? What's next? You know, like I, I like photography, you know, like I, I want to paint. I'm getting a fucking yoga, you know, cause my back's <laughs> fucked up. You know what I'm saying? Like, what's next? Is school next? Is, is whatever you like as an individual, as a service member to your country and your, your, your background, you got to find out who is who you are, you know, outside of the military is what I'm trying to say. Like, like I, I can't let Sergeant Lily be everything. I don't want it to be, you know, because I'm going to be 60 one day and I'm still talking about how I thought when I was 24, 22, 30, like, nah, man, there's so much more to all of us besides that. And we got to find it, you know, and it's, it's, there's institute, you're being institutionalized. It's like prison. It is, you know, you have to assimilate to this institution. And then when you get out of that institution, it doesn't really work too well. 
socially in a lot of ways um, in the civilian population. So I don't kind of go on a tangent, dude, but that's that's no. that's the tr- that's the true challenge of yeah. of re- reintegrating back into your small town in Scotland, dude. Like like people missed you, people loved you, you know. Like you, you and you owe your community locally wherever you're at to be an outstanding gentlemen you know like 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 be a sounding board to the youth to the youth like these kids are fucked up now man they're all on this shit right here dude every day and they think that's fucking real life man like and it's largely junk like what what they're looking at and uh, the media are getting pushed mm, on it. it's just largely junk like in it it's not real life the kardashians aren't fucking real life dude you know the fucking <laughs> they're not you know like there's more to it so i think we as individuals that have gone through what we've gone through you know we got to take what we've learned and the hardships we learn and like bring it back to our communities and make a better community like through the hardships that we've seen like do you guys really want war do you really want anarchy do you really want the police to go away like nah none of you motherfuckers are going to survive i am but like you guys aren't so you know we got to like i don't know man I don't know if that makes fucking sense or not, dude. Like, I think we owe it to our humankind to 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 to, to do more, to inspire more, right? Yeah. Do you do you think institutionally, like the military itself, does enough to prepare us for that, or do you think the onus should be on us, or do you think there should be some onus on them to prepare you for that? Like, I don't know what it's like in the U.S. military, but ours is kind of. It's 50 50. They'll pay f- for you to do courses, but there's no like preparedness or the basic shit. See, just like the simple stuff um, that you don't think about in the military, they just they don't speak about at all. They just leave that to you. That's a tough question to answer, but easy at the same time. Um, I think we both have similar, our countries have similar. Uh, I think we're doing a little bit better of what I've heard from my UK friends. Uh, in, the, in the sense of the government taking care of their their uh, personnel departing from the military, but there should be more done. I think I don't mean to sound like a fucking hippie here, but it's true. More on the spiritual uh, healing aspect, and not that it's traumatic, right? I'm not trying to be like, "Whoa, is me? I can't like, I'm sad. I'm fucking. I'm fucking broken. Like, I don't want to go down that fucking." PTSD veteran spiel that everyone fucking goes down but like I think there needs to be more time with the the transitional phase like okay you're getting out September 24th of 2024 maybe six months before that starts your fucking process and not just getting your paperwork and not here's my weapon here's my uniform here's all my serialized gear like I'm going to fucking counseling and I'm speaking with other snipers or other fucking special forces guys that are, have been civilians for 15, 20 years. Like, Hey brother, like do you need to get your fucking credit up. You need to get your fucking taxes taken care of. Do you want a fucking house? Like, like focus more on like you as an individual and not like the system. So I think there should be something more of that reintegration and assimilating back into the civilian world. Cause that's fucking real life, man. Like that's, the military is so disconnected from the civilian population uh, for good reason, I guess. But yeah. there's got to be more, I think, for the soul, for the mind, for the heart, for that individual getting out. You know, because it's kind of like, thanks for your service, bro. Like, have fun. You get kicked in the ass out the door and and you can't wait. You're fucking running. You're not yeah. even touching. The, you're kicking that fucking door open to get out, you know. But it's, I don't know, man. There should be more all encompassing and all those different areas for an individual separating from the military i think it should be a longer process is what i'm trying to say yeah yeah i think we are so we are from signing off so we call it signing off as soon as you sign off it's a year you you get it's 365 days um generally about depending on how much leave you've got uh, you'll get the last three months of that year you'll get off to go and do whatever you need to do get a new job or do that um really yeah so prior to that you'll get um so we get i think it's if you've done four years you get like a thousand pound to spend on a course or if you've done over six years you get two two and a half thousand pound which is about three thousand dollars or so 
you get to use that on uh it has to be like an accredited course by the military so like i did personal training because it was only when i was like fuck it sounds easy i'll do that yeah. it's an easy job um so you do that and then you get your whatever leave you get to go and do it there is like transitional stuff but it's literally just some woman some like 50 year old woman who's worked for the government she's a civil servant she sits in an office you go in and speak to her she makes sure you've done this and you've done that and you've you've got somewhere to stay and you've done this but there's none of this transitional stuff that, that i never even thought of that as a thing that you're saying like having veterans there and saying especially for guys who are getting out from from maybe doing 15 20 years done iraq they've done afghan they've done all this and there's going to be guys there and they're just getting chucked straight in the deep end and that's probably the, it's going to be harder for them than it is say for someone who's done four or five years hasn't said hasn't gone away they're the people that should really matter for the moment and having someone to speak to would be huge and i've, I've never even thought of that as a thing having that transitional workshop and having veterans there to basically just hold your hand as you're coming out it's just why is it not being done you said it right there man like cooking, for instance, dude, you know, I did eight years in the Marine Corps mm. and State Department agency. It's basically 16 years of fucking war fighting or at least training to be a fucking warrior. And I never really learned how to cook. Like I maybe cooked a steak or two or a hamburger, like a fucking hot dog. But I ate MREs and like whatever the military gave me. And then with the CIA, pretty good. But again, I never really fucking cooked. And I always like lived in the barracks. So I lived on a military installation, right? So, and on top of cooking, it was like construction and like how to wire my fucking house or how to do sheetrock. You know, like I've been with women that are like, how do you not know how to do this? I'm like, well, I made a joke that I'm better at destruction than construction, <laughs> you know, like, and, and relationships included, you know, like I, I, I focused on like my job in the military, which was stabbing motherfuckers in the neck. Like, how do I, how do I do this? You know? So it's like, I YouTube shit, dude. Like how to fucking wire something. How to, how do you fucking change a blade on a lawnmower, man? Like I didn't have that time. Plus the optimal of the war from OIF one to fucking Afghanistan. The whole focus was over in the desert, you know? And it's like, and even if you don't go overseas, cause the wars are definitely ending. Like you're still institutionalized, man. And you're taken care of like your, your house, your rent, your food. It's like, oh, fuck, dude. I'm like, I'm starting over. Like, what an 18, 20 year old kid that goes away to university or college, you know, they're learning this shit as they should at a young age, like how to cook at the, at the dorm in their college, right? Or, like, I didn't have that experience, man. You guys didn't have that experience. You know, it's, it's, it's that there's a lot to fucking learn. It's just a man. So, I think integrating with veterans that have been in the civilian population that have started their own business to take guys like us newly transitioned out, like, like go to like a month. It would have been great, dude. If I could have been in the military learning how to cook for like a month, like this is how you take care of an apartment. This is how, like, you know what I'm saying? It sounds super childish, but it's like little things like, yeah, these are the, these are the bills you need to take care of that we've been paying for the last whatever. Yeah. And, yeah, it's simple shit like that. Bills. Uh, I think yeah, a lot of people a lot of people I think can deal with like big things, you know, like especially young men from the military, we can deal with big problems. But yes. it's all the little nitty gritty silly things that like constantly like bills and a boss who's an asshole but he's like a passive aggressive asshole, whatever it may be. It's all the little things that really grind guys, I think, when they get out, like they can deal yeah. with I've not got a job sound. I can get the job is my mission now, or if it's stuff like big things that seem big you can just aim for that and get it. But if it's just all the little nitty gritty things that folks just don't expect, I think really gets them down. I think so. Yeah. Maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. No, I don't think you're wrong at all, brother. I don't. You're right. Cause I, I've, I've heard this from my friends as well over here. It's, it's, it's all the little things that add up and it turns into that kind of that noise I was talking about. It's like, it's a different realm of stress. Like, as you guys know, it's, I, I really go back to like, Knights of the Round Table, I go back to like the times of Vikings, you know, it's like your job is to pick up a sword and a fucking shield for your king, queen and country and stab that motherfucker to death and try to survive and then do it again. And we're on a leash, man, we're the dogs. And 
everyone else that joined the military and chose different professions, like whatever, but you are in a different fucking realm to me. Like you don't understand this. You joined to push a cart and give us berries and fucking water for us to go fight. I mean, truly like it's that fucking simple, dude. Like, thank you for working on a Chinook. Thank you for working on that fucking plane. Thank you. But our world is fucking different. And I think we have a harder time readjusting because it's so violent. And it's so vastly different. And then we get in and now I've got a cell phone bill. I've got, you know, like, like you said, big problems. I'll crush it, especially with my team of guys. We'll fucking put C4 on that bridge at night and we'll blow it the fuck up and we'll get out. We'll kill everyone on the way there and back. But like, I need to go to the mall and the grocery store now and buy <laughs> spinach and fucking yeah. some milk. And like some dude in front of me is like, I got a shirt cut off and he's all jacked and he's like pushing into me. And I'm just like, ah, I want to fucking gut you, bro. You know, like that's the, that's the challenge is to keep, to keep it contained, you know, and, and it's time and I'm getting a lot better, you know, it, like controlling that shit. It's all in here. It's all inside mostly. So I don't know, man, I think there should be kind of like what we talked about, man. And honestly, it's, it's twofold. It's up to us, the veterans to take care of our younger soon to be veterans. And it's also up to the individual. Like, and that's something you need to learn too. It's like, you're used to being things kind of handed to you in the military, like, and being told what to do to some degree. You're on your own now, pal. And like, you're this, you're this man now. You're this warrior. There's got to be some self. Uh, you got to hold yourself accountability, yeah. accountable as well. So you you have to seek help. You have to seek change. You have to want it and like understand you're gonna fall and fail time after time, and that's part of life. But you got to learn. You know, you got to set goals and set calendars and set times and not fucking drink all the goddamn time too, man. You know, that's, that's a big thing post-military, at least for us. And I'm pretty sure it's the same for you. You know, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't drink like that all the time like you, like you did in the military. Is it the same for you guys as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's the whole most guys fall down, especially guys, like we said, not so much the, I think it's the separation anxiety and they, they fill that gap with, constantly getting drunk i think i i would say our drinking culture is probably worse in the military than it is for you and that's saying something like our guys it's it's fucking heavy like it, it is it's wild so i think a lot of the guys who are used to that and when they do leave that it really is like their coping mechanism and it's fucking yep. insane and a lot of guys will go down that hole and i think that's what loses think, most guys in the end i think as well like when you're living I, I think this anyway. When you're living in like the block, like we call our accommodation, like the block or whatever, and you're there and you want to go for a drink, there's always someone. Like, cause yeah, you got yeah, your, 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 your close group of friends who are like your best buddies. But if you want to just go out in a beer and have a bit of fun, there's always someone you can just go walk around the block, you'll find some music, go down, sit down, have a beer, go yep. out, whatever. Yep. So you've always, you know, what kind of, if you're in a bad mood or if you're in a shitty mood or whatever, you can always go down. And the guys are funny. Like, if you, ha if you get like five or six dudes together, you'll have a good time generally you got, yeah. you, generally you're gonna have a good time like it's just like guys can have fun together pretty much anywhere but then i think when guys leave the military um they still want to have the drinks at the weekend but then their their mates at home like i got some good civilian mates but like they have the diff it's a different life and i have to like accept that like i fancy having a beer tonight but he's going to see his missus or he's got work in the morning or whatever and then guys are kind of really upset or not upset maybe but they get kind of like they feel isolated because they can't just go and they're used to be able to go and find some of the boys to have some fun with all the time and all of a sudden that just stops one day that just stops and they're um they kind of yeah. get they get a bit yeah, down like they can't they've not got that circle of friends even like there might some of the man in in the army they might not even be particularly friends like it's just guys you get on with you're gonna have fun with them if you're feeling bad you can go out and have a night out with them and you're gonna feel you're gonna have fun like you, um, you all equally like a drink i think that's the yeah, best thing yeah, about yeah. everyone's the same yeah, yeah. But I think that's, you say that well, because it's the same here. Like, if I imagine if I was to ask the guys at home to go in the piss, you need, like, two or three weeks' notice to go yeah, in the yeah, piss. Yeah, yeah, It's fucking insane. Like, you need to ask guys, oh, we're going out in three weeks, do you fancy it? And they're like, oh, well, I need to move some stuff around. You're like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a whole different life, especially when you start introducing wives and kids, and it just goes Life gets insane. in the like, that's life, isn't it? 
Uh, yeah, man. And it's also a young man's game. If you think about the majority of service members, you know, it's usually from 18 to 23, 25. Mm-hmm. And then you go up rank, you know, you get older. But, you know, I'm fucking 43 now, man. And I definitely hardly ever go to the bars and I hardly ever. And I used to be a fucking bar pub rat, dude. Like every weekend, any time, especially when I, in between both uh, enlistments, dude, I was, I now was in California. I was at the bar all the fucking time, man. It was great. But now, <laughs> like, I can't fucking hear, like, in a bar, <laughs> you know, all the guns, you know, with the, the ambient noise, as you guys know, from all the explosions and shit. Like, the fuck did you just say? Mm-hmm. Like, I can't hear yeah. you. And it's like also, like, the setting of a lot of people. It's like, I don't really like it so much anymore, man. Yeah. I like, I've got to that point where I like it. I can old, I like, I would call it old man pub, like just a country pub. I live in the countryside in Ireland, so just a country pub with a few mm. guys, whatever, sit down, have a, a pint, have a chat. Like, I, I hope, I hope I mean this with every fiber of my soul. I want to come visit you guys. Good day. And I, I would love yeah, to spend, yeah. I would love to spend six months or a year there. Like, I have this affinity towards Ireland, Scotland, and England. And I, fish obviously, me excuse fish. me. You should come fishing, mate. Good fishing. Yeah, good fly fishing up by me. I fly fish a lot. Yeah, you get some nice salmon up here. Oh man, that would be awesome. But you're you're it's similar here, right? But our bar and pub culture is similar. I think it's a little bit more accepted there and it's a little bit more it's more of like a family centered in a way, kinda of like your your local area. I know there's a pub and on every fucking corner it seems like from what I'm seeing. But it's not like, I don't know. I think there's some kind of a negative attachment to it here in America. To, uh, like there's going to be trouble there. But like, I, I don't see that from the videos and the movies that I see about the UK. I don't, I don't, I feel like it's more acceptable and it's like, depends. Uh, it depends. It, dep- <laughs> yeah. it, uh, it depends on what, what football game's on, right? Yeah. It depends what bar you're in as well. I, I well think was- so it's like, if I go, if I go off my street, so. Basically, I'm in between, like, I'm in the north of Edinburgh, which is, like, we've got this Leith. So it's an old borough, it's an old dock. It's where, like, Oliver Cromwell landed when he came to fight the Scottish Kings and all this shit. And um, so it's an old dock um, um, borough. So it used to be separate from Edinburgh. But basically, there's two sides, and one of the sides is on the same street as where the local, like, there's two football teams in my in Edinburgh, Hearts and Hibs. Hibs is right next to me on this street, and there's about 12 pubs all the way up it. And most of them are all Hibs pubs, which are the ones for there. So it's just, see, like on a football game there, they're just packed and it's all kicking off. See if they lose, it just goes absolutely fucking nuts. It's just, that's probably like a, a good symbol of what it's like with the football and the drinking culture. Um, but even then, it's not even tied to that. It's just, it depends who who frequents that pub will dictate yeah. what type yeah. of pub it is, which is, <laughs> which is um, always quite good one. I can understand that. We got the same same shit going on over here, man. Like I, let, let me ask you this, man. You know, I think this is good culturally speaking for your fans that are in that area and then us fucking dumb yanks across the pond, man. Like, you know, America fucking number one. Like we have a big ego, I think, as Americans. Obviously, we're proud to be American, right? But what's it like being from scotland from ireland and potentially england that you're that's listening you know you see like the navy seal movies the american navy seal movies you see american sniper movies you know like america's pretty big on fucking movies like kind of started that shit right so like what's what's it like i don't want to say like being in the shadow in a negative way but what, like, what's it like being born and raised where you're from and seeing all this shit about American war and then being a part of basically a war that America fucking started in a way where we responded to. So what, what's it like for you guys kind of being associated with the war, you know, the American war, you know, like how, how has that been, you know, for you guys? Um, I've always, I would say it's very much like, I always say this about, when you ask a question about like the Navy SEALs and you ask about those and that, and you talk about the big movies and stuff and you talk about this, it's very much in the same sense that if you think about the SAS, 
nobody really knows about the SAS. There's no big films about the SAS, but everyone pretty knows the SAS are probably one of, if not the best special forces in there. But they're very quiet and they're very much just that's they do their job. We don't need that. I would very much say it's in the same sense that I'm just just glad to be there. Don't need any like fanfare. It's probably a very British thing or a very like British Irish thing is it's not so much we don't really need that, if that makes sense. We don't yeah. need this big fanfare, just very happy to be doing the job, very being happy to be I don't know if you feel the same Dom. I might be explaining. Yeah, uh, I've never really I've never really thought about it to be honest like that. Mm. Uh, when you were asking that question, I was trying to think how I feel about it, but I've never even considered it. I generally haven't. Yeah. It's never been something um Yeah, I joined the army because I want to go and see what, I, see what I, well it was a rack at the time. I saw a rack on the telly when I was a kid growing up and I wanted to go and see if I I wanted to go and fight basically. That looks yeah, cool um, as fuck. I, didn't, I didn't really think about um Yeah, I knew I had a chance. I, that's why I joined the British Army because I knew I could go. Um I didn't really think I just thought I'll give that a go myself. I don't know, it's strange to ask that question. If I thought about it, Probably ask me again next week. I'll have a better answer. But mm. yeah, I, I've always thing. just I've always had this affinity. You know, I've read and seen a lot of movies, especially throughout the time of, of your cultures, and I've always had this affinity and this respect uh, for the militaries over there, man. And I, I just kind of wondered, since we're talking as warriors, you know, like what your perception was of the American military, and, and you know, um, uh, there's so many. I know there's so many fucking similarities, you know. Oh, I I, if, if you're asking that question, I fucking, like, if I was to think about it in general, when I look at not only, I don't know, it's hard to describe, I'd say, say out of all the militaries I've worked for, I love the fucking Americans, just because they're very, it's culturally, culturally, you're very much similar to us. Obviously, there's going to be difference. There's very much that user, the very, very much the American dream is very much who I fucking let's do this shit. And we are very much, we've always just been. British, do this, this is what we do, whether it's in a fucking kilt or whether it's in a fucking whatever. It's always been that case. But I think that's the only real difference. But um, I, I would be happy to say, having watched Platoon when I was like fucking eight or nine year old, yeah. or watching, um, um, what's the other one? Fuck. Full metal, full metal jacket like watching full metal jacket and stuff that is pretty much what drove me to join the military it wouldn't have happened if there wasn't these fucking american movies yeah. um, same private ryan for me like watching same watch private ryan it's probably like i remember watching that um and being like this is obviously the fucking opening scene is the most terrifying thing you'll ever see um and I got to see that in the cinema on the 75th anniversary of D-Day. It was fucking intense on IMAX. Wow. But no shit. To, yeah, wow. but seeing that and you're and you're seeing these guys do this and you're still thinking, this is cool as fuck. Like these guys are probably the coolest guys I've ever seen in my life. And I think that's what probably drove. Um because I didn't watch A Bridge Too Far when I was like fucking eleven year old, when it's all like posh Englishmen. It is the the story's cool and it's that but it's not as Americanized as like your stuff is and it's just pure Hollywood and it just makes stuff seem fucking 10 times more cool. Um, yeah. I think, I think as well, I think the way that, maybe I'm making this up in my mind, but I think the way the British public view the military versus the way I feel or I, I perceive the American public to view the American military is a lot different. So like we're not, I don't think we're disliked by the public, but they don't like unless it's a parade or if we come back from Afghan, they'll come out to the streets, you know, yeah, like first week home or whatever. But they're not held in high regard by the public. To me, I don't believe they are. Anyway, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just my perception. Individuals will like, especially when you meet old old people on the street in uniform, they'll always say hello to you and stuff. I find that where I live anyway. Yeah, definitely. But um, I don't think the military are particularly held in high regard. And I seen a really good video from the eighties about a Royal Marine who was a Falklands War vet. He, he I won't paraphrase what he said, but basically. Or I would paraphrase. He basically said, like, you know, when, he, when they come back from the Falklands, everyone was like, great guys, the best best blokes we've ever had. You know, these guys, they've won, won this war. And then a few weeks later, they were in our broth or something like that, where the Marines are based, and they got in a few scraps or whatever. They got in a fight in town. And all of a sudden, they were the scum of the earth again. And um, oh, we're so upset we've got Marines living in our town because they're scum. They get drunk and start fights. And he basically just said, like, it's funny how quickly they forget. And... That's right. from the eight, that's from like eighty five, I think, and I, I still think it's the same now. Like they kind of, it's not as bad as it probably was back then, but this, I think that the way the British public see the British Army, 
I'm only assuming what, what I believe the American public seem to view the American army in quite a positive light and they're quite proud of them. Whereas I think in Britain, they're more put up with this than... We're the easiest to blame, yeah, in Britain. Yeah. I think, I think it's the same. Um, I think as a whole, there's that respect. But where these bases, uh, these posts are at, right, in the, the immediate cities around it, they have a different perception of, yeah. of the military. Because we're yeah. fornicating with their daughters. We're, uh, you know, beating up their sons at the bar. <laughs> and that's... And fornicating. Yeah. <laughs> and fornicating the sons, some of us. Yeah. So, yeah, man, I, I just, uh, we're, uh, there was a, a, there's a Brit that I'll never forget and uh, kind of rhymes, right? I should be a rap star. <laughs> um, it was, he was like a tanker, man. Like he like worked on tanks or like some kind of mechanic. And it wasn't a fighter, but he was a fucking fighter, bro. And this was in Camp Leatherneck in Afghanistan in 09. And it was the last month. So we were up in Farah. We we're out west, whooping it on out there in like Helmand. And we came back to this fucking Marine base, basically. And there was like this Special Forces ODA Green Beret base. And we were kind of attached to that. And But next to the Chow Hall, the DFAC, the cafeteria there was uh a gym and there was the, a mat outside and i saw these fucking brits out there beating the fuck out of each other every day with mitts so i was like hey you got i recognized one of them in the head in the bathroom man and i was like hey dude you got room for a yank on the mats tomorrow and he's like fucking come on <laughs> so and they took me on man and i had the best time and it was i don't know man it was like our escape from that place and i remember i got my tooth fucking broken half i was like because i was the only i didn't have because they were pogues you know they weren't out fighting like i was so they had all like the shit gear. Take everywhere yeah and i didn't so i was like sure mate you need a mouth guard i'm like ah, i'm fucking good like the first <laughs> kick to the mouth like broke my molar and i was like spitting out teeth i'm like <laughs> fuck me man but his name was steve austin like oh, the fuck shit like the <laughs> like like the wwe star man but his name was and he was rode motorcycles and he fucking and he wanted to move to Spain and just get the fuck away from England. And mm. I think he's probably still in Spain now. He wants he, he's like, I just want a motorcycle shop and I just want to do my thing. And boy, if I could talk to him again, I'd love to, man. But uh but yeah, man, I mean there were there's some good times for sure. So so let's it's I'm fascinated with let's get back to the the beginning of this man and the center of this podcast you know like so tell me about being a sniper in the british army man like i'm fascinated as well yeah i think it's sounds like our, our like our basic course something, something similar to your basic course um probably probably much along the same lines like a 10-week course gotta kind of be like a reasonably senior or not necessarily senior but a reasonably mature soldier to get on the course um, they're meant to be, yeah. They're meant to be, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I always say this, like, and it's, it's always, like in Afghan, like, I like, I, Herrick in 2011, when we were 10 11, I said a couple of times, and I was like, I don't feel like we we're employed as snipers. Like, I feel like nearly like a fraud saying I was like a sniper in Herrick and Afghan because we, I don't feel like I got employed as a sniper properly. Um, I don't know how you feel, Sean. I think we spoke about this before, and we, we're both going to feel the same, I think. Um, but like yeah, we've done the courses and stuff. We've done. That. I'm still a sniper, um, but certainly when I done in Afghan. I don't think we got employed very well. Definitely not as much as like the when you chat to people. <laughs> sorry, like the American American Marines especially seem to employ their snipers pretty well. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's kind of frustrating. But... Yes, if I think back to so we were in Afghan, well as snipers, 2010 to 2011. So it's funny you should mention Leatherneck. I used to sneak into Leatherneck to the DFAC because our, yeah. our DFAC was shit. So we used to yeah. sneak into Leatherneck to get all the American food. Um, big, bag big bag of jerky. Used to get the yeah. fucking cereals and shit. It was awesome. Lucky Charles. Yeah. Well, because Le Leatherneck had the Marine DFAC, but yeah. I was, I was by the Special Forces. I was right by the, because it was like, because what was the Brit base called right next uh, to Bastion. Camp Bastion. Bastion. I was at Bastion, but I would... Yeah. And Leatherneck was just kind of starting, and it was still big, but it wasn't what it was a year or two when you were there. 
So yeah. I, we didn't fuck with the Marines at all. So we were at Bastion and we went to the Brit DFAC uh, Chow Hall. And right south of that, if you come out of the fucking front door, the, you, the same front door you and I shared, there was the American Green Beret base right there. Yeah. And that's, yeah. we stayed right next to that. Was that beside yeah. the Danish, the Danish um, camp? Danish were to the right. If right, you come yeah, out of yeah, yeah. Danish were down that dirt road to the right. So if you come out of the front doors, you know there was the gym to the left. Yeah. And then there was like a coffee shop. Yeah. Right there. And like a pizza hut or whatever the fuck that was over yeah. there at that time. Just outside of that across the road was the little green beret base. If you yeah, even knew it. Was it. Off. I no, never I, you, I didn't know it was there, yeah. There was a yeah. gate. I knew there was a gate there, but I never knew what it was. <laughs> that was that was uh, American Special Forces there. Yeah. So, yeah. Those sneaky bastards. Yeah, we we try we try to hide, get away from, <laughs> get away from our own kind. We wanted nothing to do. I got a fucking funny story, man. We're all serious and shit. So, we had to go take a mandatory piss test, your analysis, over at the main Marine Marine Corps base. Well, when so you they were deployed. Yeah, because one of my. Oh, <laughs> one of my boys oh shit <laughs> one of my boys got all fucked up on some shit and oh no everyone command found out about it so they're like blanket everyone's getting tested for drugs right fucking now so we all flew to fucking bastion from farah and it was the end of the deployment anyway and we all fucking took this piss test man but like it was fucking weird so they had this porta john this porta potty right Mm. and we had and it was on the main drive there was like marines walking everywhere and these were like not like the fighting type because they were all the outlying fobs so this is like pogue fucking central and there was like 20 of us right and we had to open up the porta john basically no door and piss into this cup and then go take this cup like a duck inside and give it to these motherfuckers and go hang out with our boys right it was like this assembly line. So I told some of my boys, I was always the jokester. I'm like, hey, watch this. <laughs> so I fucking, and there was a bunch of female Marines walking by and there was like hundreds of people everywhere. Like it's like the busiest port of John ever too. There's a group of them. We're using the far right one. So I fucking walk in and like, instead of just pulling my crank out, I drop my trowel all the way to my ankles. <laughs> And I hang my ass out into the wind, my white ass out of the end. And like this female Marine, like Sergeant Major type, like high up there starts freaking the fuck out. <laughs> and I'm like trying to piss with this woman yelling at me. My ass is just flapping in the fucking wind. And I was, and I was just making a complete mockery of the whole, like we got beards. They're yelling at us because of our beards. And I'm just like, I fucking hate this side of the military so much. So... Uh, that was like a memorable <laughs> moment of Leatherneck and Bastion. It was it was a cool time, man. So, and uh, another funny thing is at Bastion, at Camp Calero specifically was the name of that Green Beret base. Just outside of that was the tents. And if like if the front door coming out was south, we were fucking east across the street from that Green Beret base, and they stuck us right next to it was like a female base. Like we got hooked up. It was all females in tents right next to us. And like I was with someone at the time, so I was actually good. But all the single guys, there's probably some pregnancies going down from that one, dude. Probably, like, yeah. And they were out there tanning and in swimsuits. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, where am I? Like this is I should have been a pogue. This is yeah. amazing. So someone yeah. Someone was telling us a story. I can't remember who it was. It was one of the guys who used to be Hereford or was um, SAS. He was telling us in the camps they had, I'm sure it might have been similar to that one, but it was somewhere else in Bastion. Or it might have been Kandahar. I can't remember. But they had like fucking hot tubs and everything. Hot tubs. The guys used to bring back crates of beer. They used to get all the like, as you say, the pogues. We call them remps. Used to get all like the, the fucking female remps. Used to like bust them in for like fucking hot tub parties and shit. Oh. and we were sitting there i used to get sh i used to used to come off the ground i came back in to see the fucking dentist in camp bastion and um, yeah. obviously i came off the ground hadn't been in for like two or three months i was my kit was stinking i obviously fucking hadn't shaved yeah and i'm getting shouted at for being dirty and i'm like what the fuck is going on here it's just yeah, man. it's a whole different level of fuckery like it's just I've, i'm sure i've told you about it when i first saw so I got, I got injured in Harrogate, got shot and got some frag. 
and I went back into hospital and got operated on. Mm. You know, got knocked out, got <laughs> bits of my bits of my shoulder removed, bits of my fucking bits of my neck removed, but little bits. And I obviously got passed out, knocked out, obviously after the operation. And I genuinely woke up, and our our regimental sergeant major was was milling about. And the first thing he said to me was like, "You need to shave and get the sideburns up." I like, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like he was like, "How are you doing? Busted. Good to see you awake. Yeah, you need to get them sideburns. You need to get a razor and get the beard off and get the sideburns up." It was just, what? I think he, I think he was joking. Like I think he knew what he was doing. But, but I was like, um, <laughs> but "Yeah, that's literally the first, the first thing he said to me." Um, this is typical. Who was that? Was that John Miller? Uh, John Miller, yeah, yeah. John I, Miller. I, I, I think he's a good, good guy, a brilliant bloke. Um, and I think he knew what he was doing. He knew he was taking a piss, kind of. But still, yeah. at, at the so, time, I didn't. So you guys obviously did you meet in in the service together? Yeah. yeah so we um, so we were the same regiment. Um, I think we shared a room for about four or five years. I think. Yeah. Probably. So we we're both in sniper platoon. Basically, our whole journey into snipers were pretty much from like the pre course. We were together. And um, mm -hmm. we were like paired up on that. Um, and then I think after passing, I think after about a year, we, we shared a room for about four, maybe five years. Yeah. But yeah, so our whole whole time is like snipers was pretty much together, which is pretty, yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. That's awesome. And, and Dom, you're still in now? Yeah. So I, 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 done, I got out for a few years and then rejoined. Um, yeah. I mean, I know how that is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, for similar reasons, a lot of people, I think, um, like I didn't realize at the time, like you, you, you get something like we're talking about earlier on, you kind of want to join the military. You want them, you think the military is going to fill a hole. It's hard to explain, isn't it? But you join the military and then you get like a group, close group of friends and you find something you enjoy doing and you find a group of people you enjoy being around. And then all of a sudden, or not all of a sudden, but you decide I'm done. I'm out. Something flips a switch one day and you're done and you can't wait to get out. And then as soon as you get out, like that little bit of a hole that you're filled up by the military, like sort of the social hole and then the, the motivation for like getting up and working disappears. So I wasn't out for very long before I started trying to rejoin. Yeah, was, so to be honest, I was leaving to join the Australian military. Uh, application in for them that um I went to Australia, didn't like it, so rejoined the British Army. It's funny you say that, man. I have actually contemplated on joining uh when I first got out before the CIA I was thinking about the Aussies. I was looking at SAS with them. Uh, I was looking at like, the French Foreign Legion. I kind of wanted to kind of try them all, you know, and just kind of always operate and not really be in charge of a lot, really, but just be a dude in a stack, be a teammate, and kind of try it all. That's why I was really interested in going to Buds uh, before Marsoc, and then uh, I wanted to be a Green Beret after that. It was kind of like a small little dream of mine was to do all three. I know guys that have done it, but... Uh, that's cool, man. I've been to 42 countries and I've never been to Australia, which is kind of yeah, sad. It's like, it's like one of the one places, I think, shit, North America, probably North America and Australia, like the two continents I've not been to, I think. Oh, man, you guys got to come. You guys got to come here. I've been, I've been once, but I didn't get, I went to Fort Benning. It was okay. <laughs> but... <laughs> I didn't really represent the country very well, I don't think, but it was, it was okay. I've been to Benning. I went to jump school, airborne school there as a Marine. All right. So uh, I got to make fun of all the soldiers there for wearing yeah, fucked yeah, up yeah. uniforms. <laughs> Loosing their fucking trousers and shit. Yeah. yeah. Some weird shit. We had, um, we had a, a kind of a funny story. I wasn't there. So the guys I was with in, in uh, Fort Benning, America, we went out, we went out on a night out. Um, I got lost on a night out. Ended up in like a, it was like a chicken shed in the middle of the country. It was like a, an, um, it was like a nightclub. I was there with some Aussie guys and I think a couple of other Yanks, but the other guys I was with went back and they got a taxi to the gate of Fort Benning. And as you know, Fort Benning's massive. Massive. And we were, you know, do you know where the sniper school is? I down don't. Where, it's no. down, where, down where the, it's where the, basically where the, beside where the, the ranger school thing is. Okay. But they, it's, it's miles. Anyone is, it's miles. The guys had to walk from the main gate of Benning all the way there. And they were walking through, um, there's like a big exercise happening. And guys were like, there was like loads, loads of guys doing like tactical stuff all over the yeah. area. And these guys were just trudging through, drunk, two English guys drunk, <laughs> trying to find a back it, accommodation, <laughs> bumping into guys. Like guys were like clearly on like whatever, like, yeah, whatever, like they, tactical. They had, a, they had a fucking foxhole hiding. Yeah. yeah. And they were like, they, they, like, they were spotting them. The guys spotted these guys like crossing the road 
all tactically, you know, like doing a proper tactical road cross and obstacle cross and drill. Yeah. Went up, went up to them and were like, here guys, where's the sniper school? Like went up and like tapping them on the shoulder as they were like, <laughs> got the rifle up and out. Guys, are, we're, we're like, are you an instructor? But you have an English <laughs> accent. Yeah, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> Covered in puke, I think, and all of that. Guys, these two guys were like in shit state as well. They were like se- <laughs> severely drunk. Just bad, just bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just a funny, it. it's a funny. As, as Englishmen on an American base, I fucking love that. that that's yeah. a fucking. <laughs> that I, wish I, been, I wish I would have. I wish I would have been those young fucking soldiers, man. Just been like, God damn, these guys are hammered. Yeah, I'm, I'm, fucked up. I'm I fucking drunk. Were, just I'm drunk, just smelling their breath. I hope that they were like guys that were like severe sleep depth and they just assumed it was a hallucination or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. We yeah. seen missionaries last night. Yeah, yeah. It's fucked up. There's some... Speaking... Sorry, man. Sorry, uh, I just guess... sleep sleep deprivation, dude. Like I I, I remember uh... in some school, it was a night. Uh, it was a night exercise in North Carolina, and it was uh, you know it was like the fucking jungle. Man, like the, the the foliage, the green was so fucking thick, and it was so up and down. This actually might have been in Virginia. Yeah, it was at AP Hill. It was a fucking small little secret base up there, and but we were like days into it, dude, and like no sleep. I was in the daytime. I was fucking falling asleep. It was a night movement. It was a night uh, land navigation movement, and I think we were doing our pace count or something, dude. But I remember. You know, Alice packs, big heavy fucking packs, I think a rubber rifle, but just a number, I think. And I remember following the guy in front of me, and it was just like this trail up this fucking hill. Forest, man. It was like fucking Star Wars. And I remember he bumped this like giant green fern, like giant leaves hanging over, and it was a log that he was stepping over. He bumped it, and the way he moved it looked like the mouth of like a fucking tarantula. And I was like walking and I was just like, and I saw this thing and I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, and then my like guys behind me were pushing me and I was like, and like, I like, and they're like, dude, fucking what's wrong? I'm like, you fucking see that? It was like, I was high, man. Mm-hmm. Like, and that was like, you know, a day or two without fucking sleep and severely fucking tired. Just, and that's just one hour, you know, of the many hours of not being asleep. Then you yeah. throw in combat with no sleep. It's like, how the fuck we made it home? I don't know. Yeah, I think I think it's like I can't think of anywhere else. Only in the military, like people think they've been sleep depth when they go on like a go like on a session, a f- few days on the beer, and cocaine, or whatever they do. But it's different when you've like been forced to stay awake. You've had no stimulants other than maybe coffee or whatever. That's it. You're digging a hole, so you're absolutely shattered from digging or carrying your kit, and then you've got to continue like every you walk. And the worst part for me is when you stop and you just start dozing off. Yeah. And then you can yeah. move again. You're and it's like that for like multiple days in a row. And it's just, you don't know what's real and what's not nearly. It's just. My, my favorite pictures, and it's from, from the Brits, from the Americans, it's the same. And you see a guy like using a helmet as a pillow covered in shit, just covered in, in whatever. And it might even be, it might be training, it might be combat. I don't know, but you just fucking out and you're sleeping and it's the most glorious sleep you've ever had. Yeah. You know, using a fucking rock, you know, your arm, you know, just as soon as you sit down, the rucksack flap, you know, it's just like, and you're just out, dude. And it's just like 15 minutes feels, and there's nothing better than sleep, yeah. man. And yeah. the fresh water, cold I think water. I think it's the only time I've ever seen someone like physically fall asleep standing up. Like the, you'll come to a halt, you'll be on patrol or whatever and you're you're coming in and you'll stop and they'll physically you just see them stop and they just lose all function and they fall asleep it's the only <laughs> place i've ever seen it and you'll have you'll have to physically go over to them and wake them up before they can move and you're like what have i just witnessed it's just insane and it's like almost and i've done it and i've been there and i've just almost like i've switched off and you forget it's like when you're driving sometimes and you forget the last two miles you just drove it's the same thing and you're almost like you've just completely clicked off and someone wakes you up and you're like holy shit i've just been a standard asleep <laughs> it's like you'll never experience that anywhere else um no yeah, it's no the same. unless you're in prison breaking rocks or something man like it's, it's, <laughs> yeah sleep up and hunger like I, I especially during the invasion the generation kill time i remember just not eating for like a week and a half 
Mm. Maybe maybe almost two weeks. Like, dude, we were all we talked about. I'll, I'll never forget that. Like a Spara, my little truck, or as a Hector. Like we just talk about food, and they were like Hispanic, right? And I was still pretty young. I didn't have at that time very a lot of experience with Mexican food, and we just talked about food, our different cultures of food, and I just salivate, literally mm. drooling, dreaming about fucking food. You know, like it's. And I'm glad I went through that, man, because honestly, I kind of wish I didn't go through some of the food thing, because I eat like shit still, man. Yeah. I'll eat anything. I'll yeah, eat yeah. a cow. I've eaten donkey. I've eaten fucking camel, spiders. I'll eat. I eat like shit still, man. I'm trying to trying to be a little bit better. Eat my fucking greens. You know, I'm fucking terrible. I love chocolate. Goddamn. I'll eat the <laughs> shit out of chocolate. So I'm a fat kid on the inside. Yeah, I think that's... I don't know if that's... Uh, uh... I don't know if I get if that's a military thing is is go joining so young and not learning to have to have to what's the word cook for yourself or you go to a supermarket and you buy the meals that you need so you buy the ingredients you need for the meals whereas you go to the defac or you go to the cookhouse and you just fucking pile your plate and you eat and I yeah. think that, that just ruins fucking everyone doesn't it? It does. Yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, man. Like it's it's there's. I think you become super patient in some areas from the military and then really impatient in areas. And the food aspect is, you know, like, I remember you're still in, man. I mean, dude, I can, especially at lunch, lunch was my meal. I could eat like three fucking plates worth in like five minutes, like just fucking burning calories, scarfing people. Even my peers were like, God damn, dude. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like I fucking eat, dude. And now it's like learning how to cook. You know, like I, I, I bake, I bake fucking steak, I bake a chicken. I've never done that. I had to Google this like two weeks ago, how to bake a chicken. And I'm like, you know, and like it's like this chick talking about it. And I'm like, just get to the fucking point. What is the fucking recipe? How what long? is the fucking recipe? Yeah. How long? <laughs> yeah, I don't need to know what, what you were wearing that day and how the fucking <laughs> sun was coming through the window. And she's like writing in really nice font. I'm like, for fuck's sake, Martha Stewart, like, tell me how to fucking make this chicken. So yeah, man. Well, sadly boys, I only got about 20 minutes before my next meeting. Uh, yeah, we'll let you get a break and stuff before that mate. But, um, I was going to say, I was literally about to say it's been nearly an hour and 20 already, <laughs> which is yeah, fucking, yeah. And like I say, tangents, we're always going through yeah. tangents constantly. I love it. I love it. Well, it's super humbling to me as an individual to be on your show, man. It means a lot. And I mean that. Um, it's an honor to sit in front of both of you. Um, I've got mad respect from for you as individuals and then the countries you come from and your, your choice to serve as a warrior. It means a lot to me. Um, I fuck the politics, fuck the governments, but just as men. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll fight with you guys anytime. Uh, anytime. Um, so it's an honor and, and also an honor that you even heard of my platoon and generation kill from across the fucking pond. You know, like I thought that was like an American thing. So you're the first foreigners, foreigners to me that have said they've watched that. So it's uh, cool. It, it, it's cool. Big... School made it way over there, man. Oh, and it's a big, a big King generation kill was like a big, like early on would have been so I'd, I think when it came out I'd been in the army about a year and I think that would have been a big part of like just what reinforced that whole fucking military thing especially because Iraq was still ongoing Afghan yeah. was going and it was very much that it was just another one of those things where you watched it and went fuck I can't wait I can't wait and it was just another one of those and yeah. it was I think if it had been any other unit other than like recon marines it would have been a completely different fucking show just because yeah the way yeah. the guys are um yeah and I, and I bet I, I assume you can testify to like guys like fucking um uh, is it brad um i talk to brad and josh every day yeah so guys talk to them talk, talk to them every day and for you for that for that question brother our 20 year anniversary is coming up this march so it's been 20 years since that wow. that that engagement so we're having a uh our reunion our 20 year reunion in the state of montana this may may 27th is our memorial day and so the, the weekend of may 27th we're having generation kill reunion man so that's fucking sick yeah it's crazy and we still i talked to anthony jacks on the phone today jacks is one of the characters mm. um 
you know, the guy that played me, Kellen Lutz, I talked to you know, I talked to him two days ago on the phone. So it's it's a pretty surreal experience, man. It's been a very humbling experience. So and, and also on behalf of my military brother, um, especially the dudes I served with in my units, like we've got mad respect for you guys fighting over there with us. And I want the people of, you know, Scotland, Ireland, England to know that. Like there's zero beef between us and you. Like I, I look at you as equals. I truly do. Like I, we sound differently, but we're the fucking same. <laughs> you know, we, we eat a little bit differently. I think our food's a little bit better. But uh <laughs> yeah. Bear. yeah, but like seriously, man, like we and my boys respect you guys too. And I want our listeners over there listening, like our military and our people fucking respect the shit out of you guys. So don't don't think of yourself as less than ever. And I hope you don't. I'm not I don't think that you do, but if you do, don't think that. I got I got mad respect for you guys. Yeah, and Ambassador, thank you for coming on, man. Um, where can quickly where can people find you? Um, obviously the Savage Actual YouTube channel as well. Um, but where can people find you? Um, yeah, so uh, Savage Actual is our our YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe there to, to see my dumbass run my fucking mouth. Um, <laughs> but my, our Instagram is Savage dot Actual, and then my personal uh, Instagram account is Jason J A S O N underscore Lizzle. L I Z Z L E. So Jason underscore Lizzle is my personal Instagram, and I try to answer DMs and shit. And believe it or not, I get a lot of young young Brits that are asked, they're thinking about the Royal Marines. Like, hey, do you have any advice? So I actually talk to a lot of young young Brits thinking about joining the military and what to do and what not to do. First, ditch your girlfriend. Uh, you know, <laughs> okay. start training. Start training because she's she's gonna leave you for someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fact. <laughs> Maybe not, but most of the time, you know, but all jokes aside, I, I, I do try to respond to, to, uh, my DMs on the Instagram. So yeah, I'd love to talk to whoever who wants to reach out. So yeah, awesome. I'm going to send, send a bunch of dudes your way, man. Any, any Marine, especially Marsoc snipers that you want to talk to, I'll push them your way. Awesome, mate. And we'll definitely get back on again so we can talk more about sniping rather than just a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a general shithousery in the military. But, um, yeah. I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Dude, anytime. I'll do a part two and talk more in depth about the sniping realm of the American military. Yeah. Cheers, awesome. I'm, a I'm, a I'm a 308 guy. Just saying. I'm a 308 guy. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, Thank boys. You. Thank you so much.